just want to welcome everybody to Advanced eClinical Training's um, Clinical Shadowing Webinar Series. Uh, I appreciate you spending your evening here with us. Um, <clears throat> If you don't already know me, uh, my name is Leah, Leah Medwig, and I am the lead course instructor here at Advanced Deep Clinical Training. Um, I've been a nurse for over 13 years. I started in cardiothoracic surgery and then went on to a level one trauma and burn ER in a large metropolitan city, then went on to become a uh, complex and catastrophic nurse case manager for a large health insurance company where I earned my master's degree and teaching um, has always been in my heart. I love teaching new nurses and new employees and precepting. So kind of education was kind of the natural path there for me. Um, so that's that's how I ended up here at Advanced E-Clinical Training. And I'm so happy to be here as I'm happy that you're all here as well. Um, <clears throat> If you're not familiar with it, Advanced E-Clinical Training, we are a fully online um, program and we <clears throat> provide um, certifications for our pre-health students um, and our post-baccalaureate students. So people that are wanting to go on to medical school or nursing school or PA school or be a nurse practitioner or pharmacy school. So we offer um, certified medical um, <clears throat> and certified medical assisting, certified patient care tech. Some of our other programs are certified uh, pharmacy tech, certified physical therapy tech as well. And we also offer a um, certificate in advanced medical terminology. So the beauty of it is all of these programs can be completed in as little as eight weeks. And it is also um, asynchronous. So you, you complete the program at your own pace. So um, we are very flexible there. And something that I am very proud of as well is um, our lifetime career services. So we help all of our graduates and our students with um, uh, employment services even long after you have graduated. So that's one of the added benefits there. So if you get a chance, um, you can head over to our website at advclinical.org. And I am going to go ahead and put that in the chat here. So just bear with me. Uh, clinical. I want to make sure I can smell that right. Okay. All right. Could everybody see that? <clears throat> there we go. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So it, here we go. And no, so not everybody can see it. So let me try this again. <clears throat> All right, I'm just putting that in the chat. Just bear with me here one second. Can everybody see it? We're just looking for the um, website for advanced clinical, um, advanced clinical training. It should be in the chat. So no, we can't see it. Hmm. Okay, so let me try this again. All right, all right. Um, Shab or Shay, if you are out there, if you could just place it in the chat for me one more time. I think that it'll work then. Yay, okay, so we see it now, perfect. <laughs> awesome, yay. All right, so please go over to our website and take a look at us. If you're not a current student now, um, we have, we're offering you a uh, discount code for $300 off um, any one of our programs for students that are not currently enrolled, but that discount code is only good for 48 hours. And I will provide that code to you at the end of this webinar. Um, so, 
also day you will get your one hour of uh, your one hour of clinical shadowing. You'll get a certificate to the email that you used to um, enroll in this webinar. Uh, so you'll get that within 24 hours. So uh, just keep that in mind. Keep a lookout for that as well. Oh, oh, good. Okay, so our um, discount code is already there in the chat. Awesome. Webinar 300 for $300 off for any one of our programs for any students that are not currently enrolled. All right, so now that we have all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with our case today. So, <clears throat> Um, as far as the webinar goes uh, this evening, I like to try to make it a very interactive experience. So I have a couple of polls I'm going to have you guys answer. Um, also, um, I'll, I'll, when directed, I'm going to have you place some of your answers in the chat, but I'm going to ask you to please um, hold all of your questions and answers till the end of the um, so the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session at the end, okay? Um, let me just check here, we have one, okay. So um, the, um, the case, so the, the case I'm gonna to present to you today comes from a, a company called Real DX. So this company basically, they will um, film and videotape, of course, with the patient's um, uh, authorization and their consent, um, their course, their hospital stay, or you know their um, their experience in the emergency room. So you're going to be seeing a real life case with a real life patient um, in real time. So we're going to go ahead and get go through that. Um, this is case nine five nine, and this um, patient presented to the emergency room with. Um, inspiratory chest pain, which means when he takes a deep breath in, he was having pain on the left side and he had left lower leg pain and swelling as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to share my screen with you. So just bear with me here a moment. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully you all can see my screen now. And I am going to go ahead and start uh, start the video. And please make sure, please let me know that you can hear it as well. All right, hi there. We are at Yale New Haven Hospital in the emergency department. Uh, my name is Dr. Laps and we have a patient here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can you tell us again why you came into the hospital today? My, my leg was swollen and I felt pain this morning around three o'clock in the morning. I, it was really sharp. It woke me up my sleep and I, I couldn't breathe. Oh, wow. Okay. Where was the pain? It was like the side, like lower back type area, like going towards the lung. Did anything make the pain worse? Just deep. Uh, the, the, the deeper I breathed in, the more, the more sharp the pain was. More sharp. Okay. And then when did the leg swelling have to start? Uh, that was like, like five days ago. Okay. And you said it's the left leg? The left leg, yeah. Is it tender back here? No. Where does it hurt? Or does it not hurt anymore down there? No. Yeah. So, I mean, they gave me, they gave me pain medicine. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video there just for now because um, I, I have my first poll for everybody. So based on these first initial symptoms that this patient is having, he's having the inspiratory chest pain, the left lower leg pain and swelling. So what could be going on with this patient? Like, what do you think your, you know, what is your, what are your initial thoughts? Like, what do you think initially could be happening? So I'm going to, I'm going to pull, use our first poll. I'm going to launch our poll. And if you could go ahead and answer the question. So based on these initial symptoms, what do you think could be going on with this patient? <clears throat> well, lots of people are answering. We almost 
50% or more have answered the question. We'll try to get to 100% and see and see. Almost everybody has answered. Awesome, everybody's participating, I love it. You can't see the poll, okay. If for some reason you can't see the poll here, if you just want to place your answer in the chat, okay, everybody saw it. Awesome. Okay, so just about everybody has answered. So I'm going to go ahead um, and end our poll, and you'll be able to see the results. I'm going to share them with you here. So you can see that most people think it's DVT. Second in line is the pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, and then heart attack last. So, all right. So you guys are, you know, on the, you guys are moving in the right direction where I like the way you're thinking. I like the way you're putting all this together. I'm going to share my screen again so we can kind of look at um, what um, the differential, the official differential diagnosis was here with this patient. Okay, so, so we can see here with this right here, the di differential diagnosis, DVT or deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism or PE and pneumothorax, pericarditis, um, pneumonia, ACS, that is um, for acute coronary syndrome. So yes, yeah, so all of those health conditions, all of these diagnoses, um, diagnoses um, can cause these symptoms that this patient is having. Um, so you're all thinking along, doing well, you're moving along on the right, right track here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start the video again. Okay. But it just felt, it, you feel like it's been swollen for the past couple of days? Okay. And have you ever had a history of blood clots before? Yeah. Okay. When was that? Uh, 2013. 14, I had a surgery on my leg, and I was taking love and knots, but it was it was painful to take that. So, but but as soon as I took myself off of it, and I, uh, blood clots developed. Okay. And they traveled to my lungs. Okay. And um, are you currently on any blood thinners or no, like Xarelto or? Anything. Just what they have right now. Just okay. Okay, but before today you weren't. Okay. Um, and have you had any recent surgeries? Surgery was 2013. Okay. Any long car rides or sitting for a while? No. Okay. History of cancer at all? Or, or bleeding disorders or clotting disorders that you know of? Okay. All right. So we'll finish our work up and we'll take good care of you. Okay. All right. So that is the end of the video. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So <clears throat> we learned that this patient has a history of blood clots in the past and that he had blood clots from, it sounds like he had some type of surgical procedure in the past um, and, and he has blood clots or PE in the past. So um, that's not super uncommon, but why do you think that the provider asked the patient if he has a history of cancer or other clotting disorders? So um, go ahead and place your answers to that question in the chat. Um, again, um, the question is, why do you think the provider asked the patient if he had a history of cancer or a history of blood clots or clotting disorders? Go ahead and place your answers in the chat. Believe, yes, yes, it has definitely something to do with the swelling of his leg for sure. But what does cancer or clotting disorders, why is that relevant? Um, go ahead and place your answers in the chat or what, what your thoughts are. So we can kind of talk about them and, and see, see how you all are thinking here. Chemo medication that can thicken blood. That's very valid. Yes. Um, yes, it's definitely valid to know 
family history. Yes. Blood clots can be a symptom of cancer. Yeah. Or cancer treatment. Absolutely. That's yes, definitely. Definitely. And absolutely. It can correlate to some of his symptoms that he's having damaged vessels. A hundred percent. You guys are very smart. Yes. Chemotherapy drugs. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So we're all sounds like, you know, you guys are all thinking, I can see your answers in the chat. They're all coming in and they're, they're all, your thinking is correct. You're moving in the right direction. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. And definitely a history of blood clots. Yes, Linda, for sure. If you have a history of blood clots, then you are at risk for having blood clots again in the future, for sure. Definitely. Yes. Yep. Anna, you're thinking the same thing too. A hundred percent. All right. Well, thank you for um, being brave enough to go ahead and answer that question. I'm going to share my screen with you guys again. We're going to just look at a PowerPoint here. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> DVT and pulmonary embolism risk factors. So um, age. So age is not one I think that people tend to think about very often, but your age. So being older than 60 increases your risk for DVT. Fortunately, I'm not there yet, but <laughs> on my way. So um, lack of movement. So sitting for long periods of time. So often you'll ask, you'll, you'll see, ask, you'll hear providers say, have you been on any long car rides? Have you been on sitting in an airplane for very long? So that lack of movement in those long car rides or in an airplane, if you're sitting for a long period of time there can cause blood clots or a pulmonary em embolism or a deep vein thrombosis. So injury or surgery. So injury to the veins, I think one of, you know, one of the students, you are one of our participants said that in the chat, that was absolutely right. Or surgery can increase the risk of blood clots. So if you've ever had surgery in the past, if you've had a broken bone in the past, um, most of the time your provider will go ahead and put, um, will go ahead and put you on a blood thinner to help prevent those blood clots. Pregnancy. Um, so pregnancy is, uh, puts you at risk birth control pills or oral contraceptives, so, or any type of hormone replacements, um, all of these things can increase the blood's ability to clot. And we talk about hormone replacement therapy, usually in um, women that have had gone through menopause, um, they're trying to replace their hormones there. So being overweight or obese is another risk factor. Smoking is a big one. Um, smoking affects how blood flows and clots, which can increase the risk of a DVT. Um, cancer. So a lot of our uh, participants and attendees were um, thinking along the lines of that. Yes, some cancers can increase um, substances in the blood that can cause the blood to clot. And even some types of cancer treatment can also increase the risk of blood clots. And I, I know one of our um, participants uh, made that point as well. So heart failure, um, heart failure increases the risk of the of DVT and um, pulmonary embolism inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, a personal or family history of DVT or PE. And I know one of our participants um, made, pointed out that, pointed out that risk factor as well in our chat. So genetics. So um, some people have DNA changes that cause the blood to clot more easily. So one example is the factor five Leiden. And so um, this type of inherited blood disorder changes one of the clotting factors in the blood. Um, so an inherited disorder on its own might not cause blood uh, clots unless combined with one of these other risk factors that we've talked about as well. And then unfortunately, sometimes a blood clot in a vein can occur with no identifiable risk factor. And usually this is called an unprovoked PE or unprovoked DVT. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so as I thank you all for being so interested and um, putting all of your questions in our chat, I, I, um, I appreciate your enthusiasm. If you could just please um, 
keep your questions till the end. I'll be happy to answer them. We're going to go through a question and answer session there, but I, I appreciate all the enthusiasm here for sure. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back and share our screen here with our patient. I want, I want to show you guys something here. And let's go down to the demographics drawer. Here we go. So here you can see his dem the patient's demographics. So he's a male, he's 37. We don't have his BMI or his height or weight. Um, so, you know, he's 37, so he's not over 60. He does have some of those risk factors. Having a blood clot in the past is, I think, the biggest one that he has. Um, you can see his vital signs here. So his temperature is 98.5 Fahrenheit. That's completely within the normal limits. His blood pressure is 137 over 73. So it's creeping up there, but that's probably normal for him. Not quite high blood pressure or hypertension just yet. Um, his heart rate is 92. We know a normal um, resting heart rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So he's a little on the higher end of a resting um, heart, heart rate, but he's within normal. Respiratory rate is 18. I don't know if I believe that. When you get in the field, please make sure that you are always counting respirations. This is a big, big, big one because it takes a minute to fully count somebody's respiration rate. So that's just the, you wanna watch the rise and fall of their chest for a full one minute and you'll get the respiration rate. But here it's documented as 18 and that's normal. And then his pulse oximetry is 96% on room air and that's within normal limits as well. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I just want to know, so based on what we know now, based on how this whole picture is starting to come together and the information that you have, based on his assessment, based on his past medical history and his vital signs, have your thoughts changed at all? Have you, um, have your thoughts changed? So, so what do you think is going on with this patient? Is it the same? Have your have you changed your mind? So I'm gonna bring up our second poll and I just wanna see where we are. I don't know why I can't pull it up. Let's see. Go back. Okay, here we go. I'm going to launch our second poll. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, so have your thoughts changed? What do you think is happening now? Um, have you changed your mind? Let's see where you think we are now. So a little bit over half has answered the question. So based on what we know now and that how the whole picture is coming together, what do you think is happening to this patient? Almost everybody has answered around 85%. I'm just going to wait just a few more seconds. Hopefully we get everybody to answer what they think is happening. All right, so we just about everybody has participated and answered. I'm going to end our poll. And I'm gonna share the results. And here you can see DVT, pulmonary embolism again, number one and number two. Um, 
still some people are thinking along pericarditis. Thank you for placing your um, answers in the chat as well. If you can't see the poll, and I apologize for that if you can't see it, but thank you for still participating. I, I appreciate that. All right, so we're, yes, thinking, yes, D, DVT, pulmonary embolism, yes, definitely thinking along the, the, uh, along the right um, track here. <clears throat> so I'm gonna stop sharing our poll. All right, so you guys are you guys are thinking awesome. You're putting it together and it's starting to make sense. So all right, so I'm gonna show, I'm gonna sh share my PowerPoint here. So I just want to show you guys <clears throat> what uh, a, a DVT and a pulmonary embolism. So what is the difference here? So hopefully you can see, let me see if I can move my, there we go. So hopefully you all can see this um, image well enough. Um, what is a DVT? So a DVT is a blood clot that forms in a deep vein of the leg or pelvis, either partially or totally blocking the flow of blood. So you can see that um, there's a deep vein clot here. And then what is a pulmonary embolism? So what is the difference between the two? So a pulmonary embolism um, is caused when one of those DVTs in the leg, in the deep vein of the leg or the pelvis breaks off from the vein and then travels in the bloodstream to the heart and then migrates to the lung where it lodges. So the clot then blocks a vessel in the lung interrupting blood supply, which could cause, you know, shortness of breath, which could cause a cough. Sometimes it'll cause people to have hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood. Um, so that's what, that's the difference between a DVT and a PE. <clears throat> all right, so I'll stop sharing my screen here. All right, so we're going to continue to put this all together because it's like when you work in when you're working in medicine and you're working in healthcare, it's like you've got to you're putting the puzzle pieces together. So you you know you get one bit of information from over here, and then you get some more information, you get some more information, and more information, and then you put it all together like a puzzle. So we're putting the puzzle together. And so what we know now is this patient comes into the ER. Um, <clears throat> He has a history of a PE and a DVT in the past. Um, we assess that he has left lower leg pain and swelling for four to five days, and he has that sharp inspiratory chest pain. Um, so we're definitely thinking, yes, he probably has another DVT or another pulmonary embolism. So now you're the provider here. So what kind of workup or what kind of testing is going to be important for this patient? So we can we can help to diagnose and to um, actually diagnose them. Because right now we don't really have a definitive diagnosis. We have all these suspicions, but we need something to, we need to diagnose them. So what kind of workup would you do? What kind of test would you order um, for this patient? So go ahead and put your answers in the chat and we'll discuss them. So um, <clears throat> yes, CT scan. MRI, chest X-ray, yes, love all of that. CT, chest PE study, yes, blood work, definitely blood work, MRI, yes, EKG, absolutely, sonogram, absolutely, or ultrasound, ultrasound, definitely. Yep, you guys are so smart. I love it, I love it, I love it. Yes, you guys are saying all of the right things, CT, everyone's saying the right, everyone's saying the right things and the same things. So <laughs> we're putting it all together. Awesome. Yes. E EKG, x-ray, ultrasound. Yes, definitely a hundred percent. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, share my screen because I want to show you back to our patient so we could see actually what did for him. So I'm going to put this away. 
different, okay, so here we go. So we see this, we've already talked about the differential diagnosis. So patient workup. So this is what they actually did. This was the actual workup that the providers put together for this patient to diagnose um, and to confirm their suspicions of a DVT and a PE. So <clears throat> they did basic labs, so basic blood work, including a D-dimer, which we'll talk about, a troponin and a PT INR. We'll talk about those a little bit more in depth here very shortly, an EKG. Um, a lot of our participants were suggesting the EKG and that was 100% right. Um, left lower extremity DVT ultrasound, a couple of our participants um, suggested that as well. And a CTA, which is a PE chest with and without contrast um, to look for the pulmonary embolism in his lung. So as you can see, you, like I said, you guys were thinking along the right um, line. So all of our assessment and our instincts and our um, vitals, everything that we know were you know, driving us in the right direction to this um, diagnosis. So <clears throat> you guys are doing awesome. <clears throat> So I just want to show you my, go back to this PowerPoint here. So we can talk a little bit about some of that workup. Um, some of these things you may not know, some of them you may. So the blood work, a D-dimer. So what is a D-dimer? So a D-dimer is a blood test that measures a substance in the blood that is released when a clot breaks up. So if there's a suspected PE or suspected DVT, 100% all the time, I'm sure the provider is going to order a D-dimer. So if the D-dimer is negative, it means that the patient probably does not have a blood clot. If it's positive, then it's most likely that he does, he or she does. What is a PT? So a PT is prothrombin time, PT prothrombin time. So it is a pro, so pro, prothrombin is a protein made in the liver that helps blood to clot. So when you talk about a prothrombin, pro, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time saying that. <laughs> pro thrombin time. Um, a PT is one way of measuring how long it takes blood to form a clot. So, and it's measured in seconds. So such as 13.2 seconds. Um, so that's how that would, that number would come back or that value would come back to you. in after you've drawn the blood work and it went to the lab, that's how it would come back to you. Um, a value of seconds. So a, CT, a CTPA scan is a, a commuted tomography, pulmonary angiography, and it is a special type of x-ray test that in, includes injection of contrast material or dye into the vein. And this um, test can provide images of the blood vessels in the lungs. And it is a standard um, imaging test to diagnose pulmonary embolism. We have the electrocardiogram abbreviated as EKG or ECG, um, which measures the electrical activity of the heartbeat. Um, it's used to quickly detect heart problems and monitor um, the heart's health. So a lot of times um, the EKG is ordered, um, you know, because if there is a, a suspected PE, then that PE has traveled through the blood to the heart and then to the lungs. So it went through the heart. So they wanna make sure there's no, that that blood clot didn't cause any damage to the heart while it was passing through there, which it can. Um, then we have the echocardiogram and an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. And this test will provide um, images, uh, detailed images of structures of the heart and structures of the you know, heart valves. And again, this type of test would be ordered if there was a suspected PE or even a um, diagnosed PE. We just wanna make sure that there are no, there's no damage done to the heart, to the structures of the heart either. And then the duplex ultrasound. So the duplex um, ultrasonography is an imaging test that uses sound waves to look at the flow of blood in the veins. And it can detect blockages or blood clots in, um, in the deep veins. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go back to our patient.
All right, so let's look at um, the actual outcomes. So what were the actual outcomes for this patient? So we see here, so this was actually his blood work. So you can see they did a troponin as well. Again, a troponin would tell you or indicate if there's any type of um, cardiac or heart cell death, and they're looking for that. If A, you have a suspected um, um, MI or heart attack, but again, if there's damage done to the heart by a clot passing through it, um, but his was negative or zero. Um, a BNP is another blood test they do to look for any type of heart failure. Again, if you remember back, that heart failure was another um, another risk factor for uh, blood clots, but he doesn't. It, his BNP is normal. But what we can see here is that his D dimer is positive. So you see the reference, the reference range here, but here you can see that it was elevated. So um, he has a positive D dimer. So, I mean, that goes right along with the suspected PE or DVT. Um, here, is an ultrasound image of the um, ultrasound that they had of his leg. And what you can see here are normal veins, normal, this is normal, but what you can see here and this is the clot is where they're showing. So there is a positive clot there. <clears throat> Again, this is just another view of the ultrasound. I'm just going through that slowly. They also did an EKG. Of course, we talked about that uh, to make sure there was no damage done to the electrical circuits of his heart because of the blood clot, clot passing through it. And this is normal sinus rhythm, this EKG normal sinus rhythm, nice PRQ waves. This is totally normal. Now, when we get down to his CT results, I don't know if you all can see that I'm gonna have to squint to read it because it's pretty small, but um, there was a CT done and it, the impression, which is um, the impression is always when you look at the um, radiology report is going to be what the radiologist diagnosed by looking at those images. And you can see that the radiologist said that he is bilateral lobar and segmental pulmonary emboli, new since his prior examination. So this means that he has pulmonary emboli, not just a pulmonary embolism. He has more than one in both of his right and his left lung. And then this is just the um, echocardiogram results. Again, those are the, the ultrasound of the images of the heart and it looks pretty normal here. All right, so let me go back up here and we will look at the diagnosis. So I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody here. He was diagnosed with a, venous thromboembolism by lateral lobar and segmental pulmonary emboli. So our suspicions have been confirmed. He has a DVT and he has a bilateral, um, bilateral PE. Um, so now what, <clears throat> now that we have the confirmed diagnosis, now that we have the confirmed diagnosis, how do we treat it? How do we fix them? How are we gonna make them better? What are we gonna do now? So let me pull I, my last poll for everybody. So how do you think we treat a confirmed diagnosis of a DVT and a PE? Go ahead and place your answers there in our third poll question. Thank you all for participating and for your enthusiasm. You make this very easy. Mm 
Almost everybody has participated. We're almost at 90%. So I'll wait a few more seconds so we all our participants can answer. <clears throat> almost there. All right, so just about everybody has answered. I'm gonna go ahead and end our poll for um, the sake of time. I'm gonna share the results. And you can see that all of the above, anticoagulants, thrombolytics, thromboectomy or embolectomy, insertion of a vena cave filter. I'm gonna stop sharing here. <laughs> so actually all of, those, um, all of those answers are right. So if you answer all of the above, you're correct. But if you also answered any one of those, you're also correct <laughs> because all of those, um, all of those treatments are used to um, treat a DVT and a PE. And I just want to elaborate on that a little bit more. So let me uh, pull up my PowerPoint here. All right, so DVT and pulmonary embolism treatment. So anticoagulants, so that's usually the first line. So we have unfractured heparin. Unfractured heparin is actually injected into the vein, usually by way of a heparin drip. That heparin drip is titrated by usually the nurse, um, titrated by um, MLs based on um, serial uh, PT and INRs, whether it's every two hours, every four hours, or six hours until that is that number or that PT and INR becomes therapeutic. Um, then we also have low molecular weight heparin. So that's heparin that's actually injected under the skin. Um, and most, actually most patients um, in the hospital um, to prevent blood clots or DVT while you're in the hospital, because most people that are in the hospital, they're not moving very much because they're sick or they're in pain or they've had surgery. So most patients um, actually do get um, in low molecular weight heparin injections, sub Q into, um, you know, in, into their belly or their leg or wherever they want it, but it has to be sub Q um, every 12 hours. And we have thrombolytics. So commonly referred to as clot busters work by dissolving the clots. We also have the thrombectomy or embolectomy. So in rare cases, um, a surge, there, will, there will have to be a surgical procedure to remove the clot that may, um, that may be necessary. And that involves um, obviously removal of the, of the clot or the DVT. Um, and from the lungs or, for the, or from the leg, depending on you know, where it is. Um, we also have the um, inferior vena cava, and this one isn't um, as um, popular, but so when anticoagulants cannot be used or don't, or don't work well enough, a filter can be inserted inside the inferior vena cava, and that's the large vein that brings blood back to the heart to capture or trap an embolus, and that's um, what we know now is an embolus is a clot that is moving through the vein from a lower part of the body. Um, so that filter is in place to catch that clot before it reaches the heart or the lungs to cause damage. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen. I wanna actually go back to um, our patients. And we'll, let's look at his actual outcomes. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to look at his, I'm sorry, I wanted to look at his standards of care. So because of what happened, so in this case, this is what happened to the patient actually during this case in the hospital. So the patient had a normal troponin, as I said, a normal BNP, as I said, he had a normal echo. So treatment with simple, um, simple anticoagulation was appropriate. Um, 
and they look, it looks like they gave him that unfractured heparin, which was given, um, and that was given as a heparin drip. And we'll see that um, here in the actual outcomes. So you can see here, that's what they gave him was that heparin drip to treat him. <clears throat> so I will stop sharing my screen. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, I, I appreciate you, your enthusiasm and your participation. And you guys are all so smart and it was um, really fun. I think it is, I guess that's why I like medicine and healthcare so much is like is putting all of those pieces and those puzzle pieces together. It's like being a detective almost. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm gonna open up um, the question and answer portion of this um, of this webinar. So I will try to um, answer as many questions as I can. If you put them in the chat, I'll try to um, grab onto one here and there. If you have any questions, just go ahead and place them in the chat and I will try to answer them. Again, um, don't forget to go to advanced ADVC, Shay or Shab, if you could put that in the chat again one more time for everybody so they could go over to our website and check us out. So don't forget that. Thank you. So there is our website again. And don't forget um, webinar 300 is the discount um, code that we're giving to all new uh, students that aren't currently enrolled for $300 off of our program. Um, you can check out our full course catalog over there at advanced clinical training, learn.adclin.org. Um, and also don't forget that you will receive that one hour of clinical shadowing time. You'll get a certificate to the email that you use to um, enroll in our webinar tonight. And you'll get that within 24 hours. <clears throat> <clears throat> Any questions about the um, presentation itself? Does anybody have questions about, um, you need any clarification or any questions? I'll thank you guys so much. I, this, I love doing these webinars. I hope you all will join us again. So is pregnancy a risk factor for DVT because of reduced movement, lack of exercises, or is it due to blood vessels being pushed because of the changes to the body? like the baby pushing up against the pelvic region. That comes from Ellie. Yes, all of those actually. So pregnancy is a risk factor for DVT because of, yes, reduced movement, lack of exercise for some, but also you're gaining weight and that weight is putting pressure on the pelvis and the lower, you know, lower half of your body. So you're gaining weight. There's, you know, reduced movements, um, and then there's actually just more volume all overall in your body because you're growing a human. And so your blood, um, the volume of your blood sometimes almost doubles. So all of those reasons, Ellie, yes, is a reason, makes that a reason that pregnancy is a risk factor for DVT. So was the lower leg edema a symptom because of the DVT? Yes. Yes, so the lower leg edema from this patient, he had a blood clot in his leg. So the swelling and the pain because that clot was reducing, um, wasn't allowing the blood to flow where it needed to. So his leg was swelling because of that. And then that causes pain now because that leg is expanding and it's pushing on the nerves and causing pain. So I hope that made sense and I answered your question there. So can a PE be mistaken for a heart attack? Um, so some of the symptoms can be similar. So you're talking about chest pain, you're talking about shortness of breath. So yes, yeah, so if you go to the ER and you're like, I'm having chest pain, I'm having shortness of breath. First, the first thing they're gonna do is do an EKG. They're gonna draw those troponins to see if there's any cardiac cell damage. The EKG is going to tell you if it is, um, if there is, an MI or a heart attack or some type of um, uh, cardiac issue. So um, it so the symptoms can mimic each other, but usually when you get to the hospital, it, they it, they quickly you know can differentiate the two. 
But I have seen that some people will have a DVT and then that causes a PE. And then that PE that travels through the heart to the lungs has now caused damage to the heart. And now the person has a heart attack or they have an MR, an MI. So a PE can cause an MI. Yes, yeah, so there will definitely be other open opportunities for clinical shadowing. Absolutely. Just keep we um <clears throat> try to, you know, we're, we're, we're planning more and more and more, just keep an eye out for um, the invite in um, our advertisement. But yes, we're doing these more often for sure. <clears throat> so why was the chest x-ray ordered with and without contrast? I've read that studies have shown contrast to those issues for patients in the future breakdown of this contrast. So contrast can <clears throat> cause people to have difficulty breaking it down. A lot of times they won't, um, a lot of times providers won't even do, won't have a patient receive contrast or IV dye, especially if they have uh, chronic kidney disease or if they have kidney problems because your kidneys, um, everything is filtered. The contrast is filtered through the kidneys. And so if you have kidney problems, usually you're not going to get contrast, but the contrast is going to give you, they're going to give you better pictures. They're going to kind of light up where that PE is. Um, it's just going to give you better pictures overall, every time with contrast. <clears throat> Esther, okay, is there any way I can get this video sent to my email, my phone die? So we do, um, we, we do record all of our webinars. We do post them on our um, uh, YouTube channel, I believe. Um, I know there will be um, recordings available there as well. So although his bottle signs seem to be normal, there have been something to keep an eye out for as in vital signs, a hundred percent. So yes, it's that. So at this point, this patient was younger. He was what we call compensating. So although he had, he had a PE and he had a DVT, his body was compensating for it at this point, but you want to watch out for, um, tachycardia. So his, if his heart rate gets above a hundred shortness of breath, and then definitely if his pulse oximetry was lower than the normal of 92, 93 to 100%, um, for sure, definitely want to look out for that. So those are the two big things. So a low pulse, pulse oximetry and a, a tachycardic a high heart rate. And then, um, a lot of times it's uh, low blood pressure to watch out for, but that's that's all. That's usually um, one of the very last things that you will see. Um, <clears throat> so, since healthcare workers are on their feet for hours at a time, is this why they suggest them to wear compression socks? Yes, but also so you don't get varicose veins. Um, yes, for sure. So, yes. Um, just so everybody knows, we will post um, this uh, webinar and the recording to our YouTube channel and to YouTube, so you can all see it. But we're getting here towards the end. I just want to thank everybody for uh, spending your evening with us and participating. It was awesome. I appreciate your enthusiasm, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and I hope um, we see you again, and we with our next. Um, presentation, or I hope we get to see you over in one of our programs if you're not already a current student. All right. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you.